happy when I see people on the sites who are like, the art looks insane and it's 72 pages for $4.99. <laughs> I have to add this. And I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yes, you are the person that we were trying to get yep. in. I had someone reach out to me on, on Instagram asking if that was a misprint in the Lunar uh, catalog. I said, nah, man. Like, that, yeah. That's, that's it all is that just is an insane yeah. good deal. Happy New Comic Book Day, geeks, and welcome to issue 17 of the Script Heroes podcast. The show where we bring you comic news, book reviews, and industry blues. My name is Joseph Jasonowski, and I'm the writer of Gender Hero, Cunning Carly, and the Cryptoverse. And I'm Katie Markham, scripter of the Rusty Robot Country Club and ghostwriter extraordinaire. Today we're going to be talking about Daredevil Gang War number four, which is the last in that series. Weapon X-Men number one, which is obviously the first in that series. Void Rivals number seven, which is actually the first in a new arc of that series. And Batman First Night number one, which, believe it or not, is the first in that series. <laughs> That is all true. And for a back issue review, we're going to be talking about the first volume of King's Fawn by Sean Lewis and Javier Fernandez. And in our creator corner, we'll actually be joined by Sean Lewis and a different artist, Jonathan Marks Barvecci, to talk about their upcoming series from Image, Bear Pirate Viking Queen. Yep, and that should be a lot of fun. And if you enjoy that interview or any of the rest of this episode, you can follow the pod on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, all at the handle Script Heroes Pod to join the conversation. But you can find my personal socials at JJAZ1111. And I'm on all socials at Katie Markham Pro. And now, on to the news. So for our first little bit of news today, we have a tweet from a comic book creator. Oh, Handed in a brand new script to DC. The editor really liked it. Next, it goes out to the artist. So looking forward to seeing the pencils. Woohoo. Might be wondering, how's that news? Well, the creator who tweeted this out is one Marv Wolfman. What the fuck? <laughs> First of all, you have to commend the like old man core of Marv Wolfman ending a tweet with woohoo. Love it. <laughs> Amazing. Also, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why? He, later, he did follow up with one shot, and it was fun to do, replying to a comment asking about whether it was a one shot miniseries or whatever. I mean, um, you would think. I believe something. he recently did a Marvel one shot that like was just announced, if I'm not mistaken. Well, you know, good on him. Uh,. <laughs> What could I'm trying to think of what it could possibly tie into. I've seen speculate pure speculation coming from fans, and I will I will deliver this this pure speculation. Okay. Not news, not a scoop, not anything <laughs> to indicate this. But I've seen speculation that it will be a fill in issue between creative teams on Nightwing. That could be the vibe, yeah. Because good old Tom Taylor is leaving. Yeah, Denver. which you know would be would be a would be a vibe to see Marvel right? and step on I'm and do here a night for game. it. <laughs> I'm curious but it's about very the cool. artists they're gonna team up with them. Yeah, I mean it seems like he already knows whether it's you Yes. Know. Yeah. Who knows? Like Hopefully are they gonna go for soon. like a very classic look or a more modern book? Well, one shot, like, but still. I don't know. I don't know. I'm very excited though. Marvel Wolfman and DC Comics is just like yeah. great to hear. Like, I don't know. If you're a comic book fan and that doesn't make you happy, I am confused. <laughs> <laughs> um but, yeah, I, I had to throw this onto the, the news segment for this week because I think that's awesome. No, I'm glad you didn't have me guess because I simply would not have guessed correctly. Oh, man, I should have had you guess. Would have been more fun. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna make you guess something with the next... No, the next news does not make any sense for oh, you no. guess, but... <laughs> it's alright, I'm gonna guess it anyway. It is, um... Uh... It's about a publisher, if that helps. Okay, you okay, okay. The, the next news is that Antarctic Press has created a new horror-based imprint. Because everyone seems to be doing that. No, but there actually were several like pub like several things about like horror imprints and stuff this week that I just kind of weeded out and decided not to do. But <laughs> um, ooh, ooh, I know, I know, I know what it is. Okay. The news is that we put out an expose Fed Scout Comics. <laughs> that's that's not the news but that would be it's good a I, we, we we have the momentum so i'm just gonna keep it rolling here we're gonna we're gonna okay. jump right into this because we we got the momentum right now it's actually 
taking us back a little bit to something we've covered before. It's about comicsology because Ooh. of course it is. Yeah, I'm um, sure they're doing something very good and normal. It is about their contract with Dark Horse Comics to produce physicals oh. of Comicsology originals. They have mm-hmm. we up the contract, but I'm here for the oh with a caveat. Um, there's a really long statement that I will probably link so people can read it in its entirety. I'm not going to read it in its entirety here. I already have read it, so I'll kind of summarize Mm -hmm. for people the general idea. Before, the deal was every Comixology original was printed by Dark Horse. Sometimes it was two Mm -hmm. to an issue or whatever, but that was the, the general deal. The new deal is only some titles will be published by Dark Horse Comics. And it appears that this is including some titles that were told that they were going to be published by Dark Horse now having that uh, publishing, you know, revoked or no longer going to be published by Dark Horse. So it seems like now it's going to be more of a picking and choosing from Dark mm-hmm. Horse of, of what uh, Dark Horse And this does seem to be on Dark right. Horse's end. It's hard to say exactly it's very you know public company speak right, in the yeah. in the statement but yeah it says that it it's um it's going to be about two uh comicsology original titles per month mm-hmm. um and uh yeah they basically dark horse uh, yeah I, I think they're saying it's on dark horse's end because they said that dark horse has a limited amount of slots to mm-hmm. give to comicsology and so as Comixology expands their roster of Comixology originals, that doesn't necessarily mean that Dark Horse wants to expand their amount of printed titles. Mm-hmm. So now it will no longer be every single issue. That tracks. I'm wondering if we're going to see Amazon itself try to move into that. Like, they do already have structures in place for, like, self-publishing books, like, yeah, they do. Like they, because they, I mean, they have they have like comics, but, but they do print on demand, which is like yeah, different for like a you know. Mm-hmm. I guess the model would be like ah, oh, you can just order Comicsology original physicals like print on demand. Like they could do that. Mm-hmm. They have the infrastructure for that. We've seen you know uh, from our, our friend Nicholas Mueller, he does print on demand books yeah. through Amazon. Um, several other comic book creators do as well. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's an interesting. That's an interesting question. I don't know if that's the the vibe for the other comicsology originals or if they're just going to be left to to be digital it's very interesting that and i think this is actually why they've kept the comicsology branding alive is just so they can continue with comicsology originals instead of now like kindle originals (laughs) (laughs) yeah i don't think that would uh i don't think that would sell as well um but yeah that's very interesting um because i know that a bunch of scott snyder's books because he did like a huge amount of comicsology originals a couple of years ago. And I think pretty much all of those were published. Uh, yeah. Put Canary out. was Canary, a uh, clear uh, barnstormers was one, wasn't it? I think so. See, so yeah, a lot of those have rolled out and I wonder if that's part of uh dark horses motive as well, where it's like, we kind of got some of the big heavy hitting titles here from, from, yeah. you know, Mr. Well, I mean, the vibe is probably now they're only going to be grabbing the heavy hitters. It's going to be like, okay, give us your heavy hitters, but the the other people you're putting out there, we don't we don't have the room for them in in our which is fair, print, which is very which fair. is fair. It yeah. sucks for the creators who signed on the Comicsology. Yes, when the deal was that they all got printed by Dark Horse, so you sign on thinking you're going to get a physical mm-hmm. book, and now it's re up, and you hear, oh, I might not be getting a physical book. That's Unfortunately, I will also say, though, that it is in the statement that they are exploring other paths to getting books printed. Um, So it seems like the goal is still on Amazon and Comixology's end for all the books to be printed at some point. But statement versus reality is not always what ends up happening. So we'll stay tuned. Any updates on the print path of Comixology Originals will be covered on the podcast. Sweet. But I think that's the end of the news. If I'm not mistaken. So it's time to move over to this week's poll list rec. All right. We've got four books on our pull uh, pull list this week. We've got Weapon X-Men, number one. Daredevil Gang War, number four. Void Rivals, number seven. And Batman, the first knight, number one. It's a chonker right there. It is a chonker, but that's not all we picked up this week. Jaybird, what else did you grab? Yes. 
I was I got the the free Spider Man Deadpool book, which is actually pretty chunky for a free book. So that's nice. nice. I of course got two different covers of <laughs> the last round. <Ronin. laughs> You got to re-evolution. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, it was necessary. I got Saturday Morning Adventures, TMNT, number 11. And then I picked up, not new this week, but I picked up, if you find this, I'm already dead. Because look cool. And I want it. does it. look cool. But Katie, what else did you get? I also grabbed the Batman Scooby-Doo Mysteries, number three. Batman, number 145. And Creep Show, uh, number five, which has our pal David Andre on it. I saw a Creep Show. I didn't know that, that was the one that he was yeah. in. There God it damn it! I, I got it you, then. David. It, well, his name wasn't on the cover. It is. I looked at the cover. You it fool! Oh, no receipts. God. Receipts. Damn it! God <laughs> damn it! I made a mistake. I'll go back. I'll go back. I'll fix it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jay. What do you? Uh, what do you think? What do you want to talk about first? Um, we got two Marvels, one DC, and one in- I kind of want to talk about Void Rivals last, because that's how that like, I want to talk about main, like, last. Thread lines, you know, of like, ah, we this is a series that we've been reading, not necessarily in order, but we read the, the first That's episode. fair, but so have like you considered that, the Batman yeah. as a chonky boy? Um, but so is Weapon X-Men. Um, is it? Yeah. I believe you. All right, like so what is your pages. proposed order? What is your proposed order? My proposed order was going to be uh, start with Batman, Weapon X-Men, Daredevil Gang War, finish with Void Rivals. That was going to be my my proposed order. I'll, I can get behind that. I will I will accept okay. that order. <laughs> I can see the gears turning because you're like, can I do that? Is that Ooh. allowed? <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Which means we're starting yeah. with the chunky boy that we are batman first night number one the year is 1939 the world still reeling from the horrors of the first world war is on the brink of tipping into an even more gruesome conflict as fascism is on the march and gathering strength in america's darkest corners against this backdrop a series of violent murders has begun in gotham and the recent emergence of the mysterious vigilante known as the batman has the power brokers of the city living in fear of institutional collapse all of the evidence in the murder investigation defies logic. The perpetrators are all men who died in the electric chair. But when the Batman comes face to face with one of these sickening anomalies, he barely escapes with his life, throwing into question his ability to survive in a world that is brutally evolving around him. The writer on this oversized chonker is Dan Jurgens, Superman, Thor, Batman Beyond. Uh, the artist is Mike Perkins, who's done Swamp Thing, Captain America, and Green Lanterns. The colorist is Mike Spicer, and the letterer is Simon Boland. Jay, before we jump into the content, how do yeah. you feel about the format? I go back and forth on this. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's a format that I really, really like when I really, really like the book, and it's a format that I like don't love when, you know, even if I like the book, if I don't absolutely love the book. Because mm-hmm. one, it's a higher investment price. Like you're paying like is right, it seven dollars right. or eight dollars oh, yeah, for the book? Eight bucks. bucks for the book. Like that's that's you know more expensive. Um, and then it's just kind of a lot. Like you're in the book for a long time, which is nice. Sometimes when you, you know it's not necessarily like ah you're in the book longer for your price because it's mm-hmm. also priced up. So you're just in the book longer. Um, so yeah, I feel like it. It just kind of. I go back and forth on it. I don't know how to feel about the format. I think there's some really nice things that are done artistically with the extra space. So mm-hmm. I think that justifies it at points. There's some really nice splashes in this issue. Um, but yeah, I'm inconclusive on the format still. Um, that is fair. And I don't know if I'll ever be conclusive on the format. How do you feel about the format? I mean, I... <laughs> the problem is every moment that I am not reading the book, I dislike the format but as soon as i'm reading it i'm like oh this is so rad but uh you know i i see the benefit of it and i appreciate that it's like for things that have i feel like of the uh oversized uh prestige formats that i've read from dc they've all had like really good art for the format Uh, like batman city of madness also had like really gorgeous uh big pages that really felt like they filled the page. This one I also 
I really liked the format while I was reading it. I think that it it adds to so much that the artists are able to do. Uh, so, like, do I want to pick up more than one of these at any given time? No. Uh, but I, I do I do think that they have a cool effect when you're actually reading them. That's but the fair. content of the book is, is more what yeah. we're here to talk yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is think? an interesting one. This is an interesting one because I enjoy it. I think it's good. It's it's also slow, which mm-hmm. with the lecture long book can you know be a, a, a little bit um, rough. But the main thing about it to me is just, uh, especially for a period piece book, it felt kind of generic to me. Like it felt like a very generic year one Batman story that we've gotten a lot of times before at this point of ah, Batman, he's like this creature that people are still unsure about and the cops are all corrupt and we don't know how this is going to work. And it's just a more, you know, like uh, um, a more like street level crime because it's going to be like, ah, this is like killer, killers and Batman's got to go up against them and the cops don't know who to trust. But, you know, Gordon's got to trust Batman because the rest of the cops are corrupt. Like it just feels like a story we've gotten a bunch and like shoving it in a different time period doesn't, in my mind, make it not generic and like that's the thing that, that i want to say is like when i'm picking up a, a book in a different format that's also a period book i really want it to feel super unique and different mm-hmm. and this book didn't achieve that to me despite being really good it's kind of like what i said about Rated black where it doesn't reinvent the wheel but this is just a wheel that i feel like i've gotten too many times that is that is fair i hear you on it and i think that is kind of the uh one of the pitfalls that you'll fall into in doing a you know, Batman year one, essentially, uh, because it is, you know, the same story that has been told a number of times. I like this so much, man. I know that I've said it about a lot of the, like, noir detective books we've got, but it, it reminds me why I'm such a Batman fan. Like, any low-tech Batman is going to be my my cup of tea, where it's it's not that he's, you know, using a supercomputer or anything. It's he's He feels so mortal and so, like... I don't know, limited. Because I'm not a Bat God person. I don't like when Batman can just take on anything. I I am such a fan of him feeling like a part of the world that he's in. And I really like the world that he is in here. That's fair. Um, I Like I said, I think it's really well done. I just mm. didn't need this story again. You know? Like, that was my my vibe with it. I also, like, it's another one of those stories that you don't really get much time with Batman because he mm-hmm. is like this 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 creature. I mean, in general, you get much time. You don't get a high percentage of time with Batman, I'll say. Right. You get much time with everything in this book because it's long and chunky. But percentage of time with Batman, like, you don't get a ton of that. There's a lot of like, ah, let's set up how the cops are working here. Let's set up mm-hmm. how like the, these different, you know, uh, kind of characters in the world are, which is nice, but also... I don't know. It, it's not exactly what I want. It's again, like, I don't have, this is a hard book for me to talk about because I don't have much to say negative about it because it's not right. bad at anything. It doesn't do anything poorly. I just, when everything, it's like what you said, like all the pieces together just didn't do anything for mm-hmm. me because it just feels like it, it, it feels like it, it, it doesn't have anything new to offer the character. I, I hear that. I'm going to disagree. I think that it was a very, unique Batman reading experience for me, but because of the format and the time period, I think you get to see a lot of cool things that you don't get to see with modern Batman, uh, like that old costume, like a lot of the low-tech detective work. I did um, love the costume. The costume is so good. I am such a sucker for Batman in purple. Like, Oh man, I found exactly what I wanted. Yes, there's this beautiful yeah. splash page. Uh, I believe it's the first time we see Batman uh, not like cloaked in shadow or anything. He's crashing yeah. through this glass ceiling, uh, coming down full action, ready to kick There's criminal so ass. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, I'm so here for it. Uh, if you're ready, I'm ready to give ratings. I'm ready. Um, do you want to start us off? Start? Yeah, I'll start us off. Like, I can't give it a bad rating because it's not a bad book, but since it doesn't do anything for me personally, 6.5 out of 10 is where I landed. It's good, it's solid. It's seven dollars. I'm not recommending that you spend seven dollars on something that isn't unique or new. Um, so not a pull list rec for me. I still think it's good. Dan Jurgens is a writer who I typically quite like. Um, 
Mike Perkins, I don't know if I've read any books with his artwork before, but I think it's very, very good in this book. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's that's my overall thoughts. I'll throw it back to you. That's fair. I'm gonna I'm gonna pretty strongly disagree with you here. Uh, I gave it an eight out of ten. I I understand being a little put off by the price tag, but you know they're variant covers and forty size uh, forty page or maybe like sixty page books that end up getting put out for seven bucks now. So I don't know. I think that if you are a Batman fan, it is a really cool experience to read. I would to make call it clear, it, it wasn't track. a $7. It was a $7 isn't worth this book thing. It wasn't me being like, ah, oh, $7 is way too much. It was the, you right. know, I'm, being I'm $7 saying that it's not an absurd like price for a comic that is different from a regular comic. Yeah. I wasn't saying that the price line is absurd in general. I was saying that this is Fair a book enough. that I don't think is good and thus, or like unique. And thus mm -hmm. I wouldn't pay $7 for it. I wouldn't pay $4 for it. I would pay $7. For it. So, well, I disagree. I would pay $7. Which for is it. fair. Uh, and I will continue to do so. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to take us to the Weapon X Men. Weapon X Men. That's what it's called. Ching! Weapon X Men. A multiverse of Logan's band together. Phoenix recruits the young X Men to fix yet another time displaced disaster. But now the threat is deadlier than ever, and it's time to call on the X Men's big gun. He's the best there is at what he does in every universe he does it in, and this job is too big for just one of him. Wolverines from across the multiverse co converge to take on a foe even the Phoenix fears. But with friends like Zombie Wolverine, who needs enemies? Um, the writer is Christos Gage, Avengers, Superior Spider-Man, and Batman Beyond Universe. Uh, the artist is Yolade Sinar, Legion of Superheroes, The Marvels, and Firestorm. Colorist is Nolan Woodward, and letter is Clayton Cowles. We aren't big X-Men marvel -y people, but how'd you feel about Weapon X-Men, Katie? To, to, to kind A of pause up is front. never good. I know, I know. To kind <laughs> of up front, uh, I think that it's well done. I like the art a lot, and I, I didn't dislike the book. What I'm going to say is that I hope that this is everything a Wolverine fan could want. As someone who is engaged basically not at all with Wolverine or really uh, the broader X-Men outside of like the 97 TV show um, yeah. and the, the aughts movies, I have pretty much no basis for Wolverine. So this was maybe not a great uh, jumping in point as it's like, oh, here's Wolverine from this universe. Oh, do you recognize yeah. this Wolverine from this universe? Yeah, I, I think multiversal things can be very rough as a first brush with a character. Um, so all in all, I found it a little... I found it lacking charm, which I think was the problem that I had. I, didn't I thought like, it had so much charm. Really? I didn't yeah. like it. The only Wolverine that I liked was Zombie Wolverine, and that's because his shtick was being not likable. Uh which within a, a group that I didn't particularly like made him likable. Yeah. Um, yeah go ahead and, well, and give your Yeah, idea. let me say a couple of things. I'm yeah. not super experienced with X-Men movies either. This somehow managed to hit a couple of the characters that are in like the few things I've read. Marvel Zombies being a Robert Kirkman book is obviously one of the few Marvel books I've read. Old Man Logan is one of the few <laughs> Marvel books I've read. So it hit a couple characters. And I always thought the Age of Apocalypse Wolverine just looked awesome because I've seen him on things before. Uh, one of the main draws to this book for me, I was like, God, he looks so cool. Um, so, like, there were a couple characters that I knew um, out of this team. Uh, one of my main things was that I wish there was a little bit more characterization for the Wolverine team members. Mm -hmm. But I felt like it was, it did such a good job, I felt like, balancing all of these just Marvel characters would kind of be pulled in and done stuff. But I felt like they all had strong characters and it was interesting. It felt like a nice little sampler of the Marvel Universe. It's like, ah, here's Magneto now and here's... You know, here's um, Spider-Man now, and here's this character. Like, it just felt really cool in that sense. It's chonky, so you felt like you got a lot of content. I thought the action looked really cool in a lot of mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah, I, I I quite liked it. Um, I'm trying to think now of the, the villain's name, and it is escaping me. Onslaught. Um, Onslaught, yeah. Uh, I thought Onslaught was built up to be, like, this really cool threat i'm not going to spoil the twist but there's a really cool twist in here that i quite mm -hmm. like um yeah i thought this was this was a lot of fun 
and I, you know, I took it for the fun that it was. It was a bunch of Wolverines teaming up uh, to go on a multiversal quest and interact with a lot of cool Marvel characters. And uh, yeah, even if somebody's not overly exposed, despite having a little bit of exposure to a couple of the characters, I thought it was really, really fun. Yeah, I, are you ready to hop into ratings? Uh, sure, if you don't have or anything you... else to say, we can... Oh, I mean, no, I, no, 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 again, it just... it. It's one of those things that uh, I think has come up a couple times on the pod where when a book isn't, when you're not the target audience for the book, it's hard to say negative things about it because it's like, yeah, this wasn't for me, but it wasn't for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. So again, I hope how Wolverine fun fans... Marvel this page is. You got like Wolverine with oh, yeah, that's Captain America, the, the, and then there's like a Magneto, At the front, I said that the art was pretty it. good. So cool. uh, I enjoyed a lot of the action yeah. as well. Um one character I did recognize was this Glob. Dude, you can just see his uh, one yeah. of the uh, one one of the Wolverines meets up with Glob at one point, and one of my uh, pals has explained to me Glob's vibe in the past, and I'm like, hmm, that's funny. So I did chuckle when I saw Glob. Uh, but yeah, I think that as someone who is not at all a uh, active member of the Marvel community, I felt a little lost. I felt a little like. It didn't really feel like an invitation, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's fair. Do you want to yeah. throw your rating and then I'll, yes, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll come uh, up with something more positive, probably. <laughs> for sure. I mean, that's how it normally ends up with us. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I, I gave mean, this just a six out of ten. Last book, so. Again, I yeah. think that it's a good book. It's just not a book for me. Uh, and I would not track. call it a pull list track. Okay. Um, yeah, I like I, I said, things fun. I think there's a, a, a very good opening that grabs you i think it's like this slow build but like a, a nice slow build that start like it gets progressively faster and more intense um and then i thought there was a really good uh twist i just wish the the team was a little bit more fleshed out and accessible i think it's a really good deal for the money too it's five dollars for 40 pages so that's nice um, i've been bringing that up so often lately <laughs> because it's important when we're t- telling people you know whether sure. or not they, they get stuff like more pages for less money is a good thing um <laughs> Yeah, I give this an 8 out of 10. Uh, I really, really liked it. I think that it is, it feels like a fun invitation to the Marvel Universe. Like, look at all this cool shit we have at Marvel. Like, yeah, I want to play with that cool shit. That's cool. That's fun. Um, and I'll give it a pull this back. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right. Well, speaking of the cool shit they have at Marvel, are you ready for Electra? I am. Let's move into Daredevil Gang War number four. Daredevil Gang War number four. Electra's last stand. There are not many characters in the Marvel Universe with the determination, grit, and guts to outmatch Electra Nachios, aka the woman without fear, Daredevil. But in her far-reaching, bloody campaign to conquer New York, Madame Mask has done just that. With a blade literally at her throat, it will take all of Electra's resolve to save not only herself, but her neighborhood, and the toll will be incredibly high. The writer here is Erica Schultz, X-23, Xena Warrior Princess, and Forgotten Home. The pencils are Sergio Fernandez de Vila, I was done Captain Marvel, Conan the Slayer, and Project Superpowers. The inks are Sean Parsons, the colorist is Cece de la Cruz, and the letterer is Clayton Cowles. Jay, we're at the end of Gang War. Yes, we How'd are. How'd you feel about it? This felt like a return to form to me, uh, this issue. It was just kind of back to, let's have some fun, cool action. And yeah, that was great. And then there was a little bit of story stuff in there kind of throughout that I thought was fairly well done. Um, There's an interaction with Spider-Man at the end that I think does its job really well, Mm -hmm. though it makes me hate Spider-Man. But yeah, I thought it was just really enjoyable. Like I don't have, like there's so many incredible panels and Mm -hmm. splashes and like just awesome moments. There's this gorgeous like two page a sequence that's uh, continuous across the pages with the paneling that's super cool. Yeah, so like I don't, I don't have a ton to say about this except that I really enjoyed it. Like that's where I'm at. I don't know how you feel. I actually don't think it stuck the landing. Like Ooh. I was such a big fan of issue one, and I hear what you're saying with the like content of it being a return to that. But I, I don't know. I feel like it felt like a, it didn't feel like a satisfying conclusion to the arc that was happening here. And I know that it wasn't like a, a 
this specific issue wasn't necessary for gang war. Like, gang war is over here. Yeah. Uh, and this is the aftermath of it. I, I felt like the interactions with the assassin were not... The, I don't think they had the emotional weight that I would have wanted them to with how much she's been built up as like um, this kind of opposing force to Daredevil, um, especially because, if I'm not mistaken, there's not an Electra Daredevil book going on right now. So there's no nowhere for there's this the, to continue. There's the main Daredevil book, which I believe which she's, she's in, like a side um, character in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because uh, and there's Daredevil Matt's Black back. Armor, which is like a you know not Electra book at all. No, that's right so there's there's this movie. very climactic fight that doesn't feel climactic to me i guess uh but i will say the action did look very good for the first time though there were a few panels where i was a little lost on what was happening it happened a couple times specifically with people like falling off of roofs and that being a very dramatic moment and then them fixing that problem without us really seeing the solution to it um just a couple, a couple of odd places where I was like, oh, what happened there? How did this work out? Uh, and being a little confused in that. Uh, but like you were saying, the interactions with uh, both Spider-Man, because she talks to both Spider-Man, I think are yes. exactly what you would have wanted out of that She-Hulk interaction we saw in a previous issue. Yeah, I like these where, much better than the She-Hulk interaction. Exactly, where Elektra is taken seriously and the Spider-Man are put in like kind of the worst light. Where it's like, oh, yeah. they're they're yeah. they're being a little chit chatty. They're being a little chit chatty. Uh, yeah, because it's from her. Like, it, it, they actually feel from her perspective, whereas the other one felt exactly. like the actress from She Hulk's perspective, which is mm-hmm. weird in a Daredevil book. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I think I that was really confused well with any of the action stuff. I just want to throw that out there for mm-hmm. like I didn't find any of it confusing. I actually can't remember. Like, I only remember the one roof thing, which I thought was very clear what was going on. Um, but I can't think of another inter- uh, situation where anything like that happened. But we don't have to get into that too much now. Um, yeah, I just want to throw that out there. But you, yeah, because you uh, there's the time that Electra falls off the roof, and then she says that she can't like hang on to anything, and then we see her throw her side, but it doesn't like catch on to anything. It hits the the assassin, and then she's suddenly back up on the roof, and then at one point the assassin falls off the roof, and she like, I guess sprints up the side of it, and like there's an element of okay, they're superheroes doing super heroic things. But there's also an element of what just happened, at least when I was reading it. And totally valid if that was not a, a, a universal experience. Definitely could be a me yeah. issue. Yeah, uh, how would you how would you rate this bad boy? Um, I give this a 7.5 out of 10. I thought this was really, really fun and enjoyable. Um, I wouldn't jump in at issue 4 if that's not <laughs> right. obvious. But I do think the, the, the 4 issue series is worth uh reading you said that you didn't think it's like the landing and wasn't uh it didn't really you know like bring it to a close i thought that electra's arc throughout these four was quite interesting um it remains to be seen where like this version of electra goes and whether or not that's something that's awesome but i quite like kind of what they did with electra's uh arc across these four issues so yeah fair enough fair enough yeah i i dropped this one to a 5.5 uh, confusion in action is like a really big sticking point for me because it pulls me out of the actual book so much and totally valid if that wasn't, you know, a universal experience again. Um, but yeah, it was really disruptive for me and I didn't think that it ended the story super well. So I also wouldn't call it a pull list wreck, naturally. Uh, but are we ready for? But Void Rivals number seven. Let's do it. Void Rivals number seven. In this new story arc, Derek and Salila traverse the northern wasteland. Danger, danger lurks around every corner while the Void Rivals corner of the Energon universe continues to grow as Proximus is on the hunt. The writer of this book is, of course, Robert Kirkman of The Walking Dead, Invincible, Oblivion Song, many other books. The artist is Lorenzo De Felici, also of Oblivion Song and of Chroma. The colorist is Patricio Del Pecci, and the letterer is, of course, Russ Wooten. We are back with We're more back. Void Rivals. Yes. Katie, how do you feel about Void Rivals number seven? Yeah, so uh, for those who don't know, we did a bonus uh, episode on Void Rivals where I read the oh, entirety of volume one for the first time. Uh, one of our best episodes, in my opinion. Super great. I think Go it's an awesome it. episode. Me watch too. it. It'll um, be linked. Probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the start of a new arc, so it's naturally got quite a bit of setup going on. 
Uh, yep. I enjoyed a lot of that setup. One thing that I want to just freak out about is just Robert Kirkman's vision is so insane. And obviously uh, De Felici is a huge part of this as well, being the artist. But the fact that there are, you know, two double page splash pages, there are like two panel pages, then there are also like 16 panel pages and super dense. It's, it's such a, like, I've said this about a few things, and I think uh, specifically with Robert Kirkman, it's such a comic book comic book, you know? Uh, like it, the, the, the reason I love Robert Kirkman so much, and that is that is the reason every comic book just feels like it was made for comic book fans, which is yes. you know what we are. <laughs> exactly, and so his his the whole team like their vibes with uh, oh yeah coloring, their vibes with layouts, uh, their vibes with characterization are so so good. The really only nitpick I would have about this issue is that. I, it probably could have used a little more, um, I don't want to say recap, because that's not exactly what I'm going for, uh, but a little more catch up in its, uh, in its setup. Uh, just some things yeah. that would uh, kind of remind you of the stuff that's important from the previous issue, because this had a month yeah. long gap between issue six and yeah. issue seven. Um, yeah. That's the that that's super fair. It definitely mm-hmm. feels a little rough for the first issue of a new volume, but like at the same time, I look at it from like the current perspective. I'm like, when this is in that big phone book, if it gets to that many issues, <laughs> I'm gonna be so happy that it just flows through yes. so nicely without anything like retreading. Mm-hmm. Um, which it feels like Kirkman books are just so intended to be one story all the mm-hmm. way through. Like there's absolutely very little in general. Like you will be told many times from Robert Kirkman that like issue 50 issue whatever is like a good jumping on point you know good for new readers you can jump on here it's almost never true like you (laughs) you usually have to read the whole thing new issues in robert kirkman books are very rarely nice jumping on points which is a a a very fair criticism but also part of what makes them so good when you go through them all together so it's a it's a trade-off which is a very Mm -hmm. fair criticism that i'm just trying to show the other side of it oh yeah i I agree that that was one of the the hang-ups here i do want to just also hit on what you mentioned, like Lorenzo's page layouts are mm-hmm. so strong. Two page spreads, twelve panel grids, whatever. Like it was a sixteen so good. panel grid, so strong. I think sixteen panel grid, um, so good. And then like we get like a page like this, that's just like two big heads and then little panels underneath, like just really yeah, two pages the best right way after each other on the same spread yeah. with just two and giant heads page, as the main which panels. Is like this. Yeah, and that being, like built for this guy, insane. Uh, but yeah, it does so, so much so, cool setup. So excited to see what's coming with this series. Yeah, my main thing that I said, which is kind of a little, bit, is I just kind of wish a little more happened. It felt yeah. like we were very static in this issue. Mm-hmm. Um, very enjoyable. There was no page that I wasn't like absolutely loving. I was just by the end, like by the time I hit the end, I was just like, oh, that's that's it. Like mm-hmm. we're done. We didn't move any any more forward than that um but that's like it's a small criticism in a book that i love you know mm-hmm. like that's that's how i feel about void rivals it's like oh what would i have wanted out of this issue it's never me being like oh man that issue of void rivals sucked you know it's like no right. it, it was really good it's just like man i want i want more i waited so long for more void rivals <laughs> and now i want even more <laughs> yeah and i i think but, specifically yeah, what you touched on there is that we specifically didn't get movement of Derek and Salila, who are, you know, the yes. Void Rivals. Um, so seeing them not do much was a little rough for a, for a first issue. Yeah. But, you know, like you said, it's yeah. all going to mesh so well when it's uh, in a full omnibus. Oh, yeah. Well, we're just sitting there just, oh, man, it's time to go back through the whole series once it finishes, wherever it ends up finishing. It's going to be so nice to just be like, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. What they call, you know, Robert Kirkman, I think is, and I've heard people call him like the master of one more issue. Mm -hmm. It's just like, ah, one more. And I think part of that is because the issues when you read them alone are sometimes like, ah, that wasn't enough. So kind of a skill, a little frustrating, but kind (laughs) of a skill. (laughs) But do you want to get to ratings? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I give it a 7.5 out of 10. Uh, Again, I think that it's harped a little or harmed a little by being the start of a new arc 
for someone who yeah. maybe isn't a great jump on uh, a jump on type of writer. But I do think that this is if you're looking to get into Void Rivals, you should read that first arc. If you're looking to just jump in, this is okay. I'm going to call it a tentative pull list rec, but with a strong recommendation to read volume one first. Yeah, I'm not going to be too far off on anything you said there. I give this an 8 out of 10. I just really, really enjoyed it, even for, like, the little... Like, it was really fun. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of... In a, I'm not going to give it a pull list rec, just because That's I, fair. I don't think you jump on here, in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to give the series a very strong pull list rec. Like, the first trade just came out, I think, a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago now. You can find that first trade. It's a Skybound Kirkman trade. You can find it. Get that trade, pick up this issue, and start reading the series is is my opinion. Even more Energon books seemingly are being announced by the day, so get into the world. Um, yeah. But yeah. But I think that's going to take that's us to a... the end of our uh, pull list rack for the week, which means we are headed over to the back issue review with King Spawn Volume 1. So for today's back issue review, we're going to be talking about King Spawn Volume 1, written by our guest for today's episode, Sean Lewis, who's worked on The Scorched, Above Snakes, Action Comics Backup. Um, the art is mainly by Javier Fernandez of Nightwing, Green Arrow, Detective Comics, Justice League, and then letters are by And World Design, colors by Ficio Penaceria, and then there's additional art by Brett Booth, Marcio Takara and Philip Tan for certain sequences with the characters from the other books that were launched at the same time as this one. Um, but this is our first foray into the world of Spawn. And uh, yes. the quick little blurb that the trade has is, is very quick. <laughs> when one of the vilest creatures ever imprisoned as hell is released back on Earth, Spawn follows the clues right back into a trap set just for him. But why does King Cade want Spawn to ascend the throne of hell? And what prophecy of the king spawn has in store for him so basically that's the story it is kind of these evil demonic forces trying to go king spawn into or spawn into becoming the king of hell um yeah yes i think the, the context that i gathered from the book is that spawn has locked both heaven and hell so spirits cannot go to or come from either place uh, and through horrible crimes, like blowing up children, uh, the uh, the forces of evil are trying to get Spawn to reopen those and take his place as the king of hell. Yeah, because kind of a long, and this is funny because they just resolved it, where they're resolving it in like Spawn 350. I can't remember if Spawn 350's come out yet or not. It has. But it's been, a, okay, it's been a really long time since uh, the basically Spawn killed the king of hell. And so there has been no King of Hell for 300 issues, something like that. <laughs> um, so this was kind of playing with that a little bit and it has now been resolved. But um, yeah, uh, I've dipped in and out of Spawn mm -hmm. a lot. Like I've read bits and pieces of Spawn. I've read trades of Spawn randomly. I read the first, I don't know, 12, 15 issues, you know, at some point when I was like, ah, oh, let me give Spawn a shot. I don't know if you've even engaged that much, but neither one of nope. us has like read all 300 issues of Spawn or anything like that. No, this is my first exposure to Spawn. I haven't even seen like the movies or I think they did like an HBO animated show yeah. at some point. The, the animated show is much better than the than the, the film. But the film I've the heard actually incredibly good stuff. things about the animated show. The really. show's really good. The show's yeah. really good. And it has Todd McFarlane like at the end of episodes being like, hey, I'm Todd McFarlane. I made this. And it's it's very cool and fun. I love that for him. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, this is literally my first exposure to Spawn. Uh, like, I, I sell comic books at the bookstore that I work for. So, like, I have a little stash of Spawn number ones to, to, to sell. And, like, you know, we see through Spawn pretty often, you know, being, like, the highest selling indie book at the time. I don't remember if anything's beaten its record since. I don't um, think anything's beaten it since. It was like yeah. one point something million copies. Not mm -hmm. not gonna be beaten, I think. Yeah, ever. at least not by an indie book. Because I think X-Men uh, number one. Yeah, Jim Lee's X-Men yeah. is number one all time. And then there's yeah. like X-Force by Rob Liefeld, which is like two. And then Spider-Man by Todd McFarlane is like three. And mm -hmm. then 
you got like spot 90s had those <laughs> millions of copies of books yes. sold yes i mean doesn't all the happen anymore uh yeah, but that's yeah. the we are here to talk about spawn which is number one indie yeah. book um yeah so i see it all the time i've probably seen most covers of it uh i'm a big fan of uh, Brett Booth, and I believe he ended up doing a bunch of the art for Gunslinger Spawn. Yes. Uh, so I've seen a lot of the art for that as well. I think he's, he's um, either moving on to the main Spawn book right now or King Spawn, because I know I heard something like they're flipping artists. Like, they're not changing mm-hmm. but they're flipping what artist is on, like, what book to try to, like, you know, let them draw different things. <laughs> but Todd McFarlane keeps an enti- incredibly tight grip on really talented mm-hmm. artists. <laughs> so, Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, I I have zero contact with Spawn. That being said, I feel like this was both a good and not so good place to jump in. Like, I feel like that's just all of Spawn. I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, it's it just just to get what I'm assuming is you're speaking about here is the story's very accessible, but there's a lot of just hits of ah here's this thing that <laughs> happened here, here's this thing that happened here, here's this character from this thing, and here's mm-hmm. this character from that thing, and that just from my exposure to Spawn, is kind of always what it is. It's very much just like, ah, let's, you know, the the story never really needs other context. Like, you're never going to feel like, I need to read the issue before Mm. the story arc, before this story arc, but you might be like, I don't know who this character he grabbed from 200 issues ago is, you know? So <laughs> Which was so funny because he literally, one of the editorial notes in there was like, see Spawn number five. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Insane. Um, so to 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 be clear, this is written by Sean Lewis, so not not Todd McFarlane who's doing this here, but Todd McFarlane yeah. is the one leaving the notes that say yes. go see this book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, anyway, continue with your your, uh, your yeah um, feelings here. I liked it a lot as a first exposure to Spawn because this book is so tied to his backstory. We get yeah. a good amount of you know Spawn but also a good amount of history on Al Simmons, you know, the, the man yeah. behind uh, the symbiote. Yeah. I think he called One of the few too. things I had, because like I said, I've read the very beginning of Spawn. So this was like, ah, that bit I know. Like that, that <laughs> bit I got. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it was it was very good for introducing who he is. Uh, I think that where, where it was a little rougher was introducing his supporting cast. Because uh, I don't know how common it is that he like, really sticks to his guns on the the i work alone side of things uh i I think that was like the new thing at this point because they were launching from spawn to the four books and they mm -hmm. did like spawns this was around spawn 300 they did like spawns universe and i tried reading like all the number ones and stuff at this point so i like i have that little bit of context but also Mm -hmm. a couple years ago now so slightly faded context but like the spawns universe was like the book that they launched all out of and then like okay gunslinger got its own book and then king spawn became its own book which for listeners context king spawn isn't like a different character it's like the detective comics equivalent for batman mm-hmm. like there's there's a batman book and there's a detective comic book both batman king spawn and spawn are the same thing where it's both yeah. main spawn and then there's the scorched which is like the team book with the other th- those are the other spawns we kind of kept flashing to of like mm-hmm. ah here's medieval spawn and here's um she spawn and here's yeah. uh the redeemer um the redeemer's name was the one i was stuck on there for a second but i, I got there um, i don't think i remembered him was he the computer um, guy? No, he's like the the like angel knight guy. Um, I don't know that we saw him much in King Spawn. Um, he 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 had like he was the the main character across like all the backups. Um, and then uh, gotcha. yeah, he was. I think we flashed him a couple times. He's the okay. I'll, I'll try to grab him here. Uh, no, that's like, fine. Uh, this, this is this is him. This this is the lad. Oh, yeah, the dude in, like, the... Gotcha, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The guy who kind of looks like um, Dr. Fate if he had, like, giant wings. <laughs> <laughs> um, but to kind of, uh, you know, nice transition there to go to the way that all the characters look, so fucking badass. I mean, so many of them designed by Todd McFarlane, I think. Like, Spawn and Medieval Spawn, I know, were both from him. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Medieval yeah. Spawn came pretty early on, I think. I, I think don't Medieval know Spawn was in number either. eight, because I think he's yeah. in the same book I as can't think Angela. Of yeah. Um, which is obviously um, the whole lawsuit and, and yeah. you know. The we, Neil Gaiman. Not to get thing. into that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he doesn't have Angela anymore. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Look, um, that's just another yeah. one that I have sold a lot, so I've written first yeah. appearance of Angela, first appearance of uh, yeah, King's yeah. Bond. Yeah. Um, I don't think she spawns said, that early. I don't think Redeemer. I don't is think so either. Because we've had either. some she spawns. I think she was. Because I think she spawn was like kind of a oh I don't have Angela anymore. I need a new main <laughs> female character to sell. And um, I like she spawn a whole lot. I really like her really, when she really was fun. involved. Um, we got a uh, what was a huge reveal to me. I don't know if this was known in the spawn canon that she's the one who killed Al Simmons. I don't know if that's no. It, it, I, I have not encountered that before. I don't. Yeah, I don't know if that was like a new reveal. It felt like a new reveal. At yeah, the very least, I think it, it felt is. like a huge reveal uh, in the book, which was yeah. super cool to see. Like it, it was. Uh, yeah, I feel like we've been saying a lot about the meta stuff around this book. To focus yeah. in here on King Spawn. Yes, yes, it had such an engaging plot. Uh, it did because, like we, like we said, they're trying to get the the the. The evil people, essentially, have yeah. um, wormed their way out of hell through a, a crack in these, like, gates that, that uh, Spawn has exactly. created. And they are on a mission where they are killing children by the dozens to be like, Spawn, are you going to, like, not let them into heaven? Huh? And there are, like, a bunch of really sick Bible verses that they pull in that are like, this is what's informing us. This is the, you know, are you, are you gonna, are you gonna not let them into heaven? Go on then. Open the gates. Uh, and Spawn, obviously, is not opening the gates because there are bigger and badder things waiting, uh, to come out. But it's, it's a really, it's just such a violent and upsetting thing to read that I think it really set the tone for the book. Being like, oh, this is, this is a bunch of very fucked up shit. And yeah. It was really cool to see Spawn engage in that because, you know, he gets angry. He he uh, has this, like, I don't know, bloodlust for these people. And it just, it shows so much and it allows him to be so emotive and so, like, righteously furious. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and, and all throughout that is just some of the best comic book art you'll ever see, which I it's feel like so is, a, is a, a, a concept of Spawn. I need to show off this page i i'm gonna try to get the double page spread on here like as well as <laughs> my I can. dude why don't you use your words what do we got here i don't know if i like I, it is just these <laughs> chains like coming oh yeah so spawn is off page. on the on yeah, the, the, the yeah. side that you open to and we see all of these panels popping up on the that page and the other ones and breaking through those you know uh yeah. panel breaks are spawns yeah. chains there's so much forward momentum on that page it's so gorgeous, yeah. and then you have the little boy like with the crown, with the and the whole thing with the, the like little boy like trying to give Spawn this crown is just so horribly metal in the like worst and best ways. Yeah, which and like the the main thing about this, I feel like just throughout reading it, and again, most of my experiences with with Spawn is just it is the epitome of the rule of cool of like mm-hmm. nothing matters as much of just. Is this going to be cool? Are people going to want to see this? Are people going to want to read this? Like, yeah. Okay. Everything else we can we can figure out later. But like, yeah, no, this this would be really cool. Let's do it. You know? Yeah. Um, and that's what this book epitomizes. And that, that makes it really fun. Um, and like also just I feel like every issue ends on such a like epic note. You know, mm-hmm. here, here's, here's another one of like, ah, here's this kind of little boy with the crown again and you see the villains like still alive despite being like uh i can't remember his name right now but um despite Kincaid. being like, ripped to shreds king cade yeah king cade's like still alive despite being you know gored like you <laughs> were saying like, rule of cool spawn like yeah. sends his dark energy into the bad guy and then teleports into it and like there were all those memes around like ant-man crawling up thanos's ass yeah. and exploding him from the inside yeah he basically does that but yeah, he was instead. Uh, yeah. and it's so violent and gory and fucking cool yeah. like you said it's that is but, really but that, yeah, that's what, it's like okay can we do this yeah be cool but we still need the villain for the next issue it's like ah well we can still do it and what do you mean we're gonna blow him up hey he can't <laughs> still be there in the next issue it's like why can't he why can't he, he can't? he's being yeah. held together by like evil demon power yeah uh and Let's he is it. there's like this he's being held in this strange 
uh, like suspended state, and it's it's so yeah. rad and so menacing. Um, yeah. And so yeah, I feel like you get to see a lot of cool things with Spawn. The the action, um, the like concepts of the world with all this like heaven and hell and the the space in between. Uh, and also the like very heartfeltness of Spawn. There's a lot to do with his wife and his daughter here that really humanize him as a character. Um, I believe the little boy's name was Simon. I want to say that sounds Maybe? potentially. Uh, but there's this little boy whose soul was not able to ascend because the the gates to heaven are closed, and Spawn ends up essentially saving him. But then there's nowhere for him to go, so. He has to leave him behind with, like, this earth spirit. There there was just a lot of stuff that makes you say, God damn, this is a rad fucking universe. Yeah. I want to dive more into all of this. Fully, fully agreed. And I think Sean Lewis just is such a good writer mm-hmm. for this. Like, the dialogue he writes for Al Simmons' Spawn yeah. is just so good. Like, you sit there and you're really like, man, no, that, that line is metal and awesome. And then the next line is metal and awesome. And it just, it's like you said, like his anger comes across so mm-hmm. genuinely, which is like, like we're in the era of the anti-hero right now. Like you get burnt out on the like, nah, fuck you. I hate you. You, you piss me off so much. That I'm just going to kill you. And I need to mm-hmm. like get there. It comes across so genuinely from spawn in this book. Yeah. When he's like, I am going to rip you to this line that's somewhere <laughs> along the lines of like, I'm going to rip you to shreds. And it comes across so well. It fits his character so well. And it comes it across really so genuinely because of the way Sean Lewis writes his dialogue. Um, and I felt like most of the dialogue writing in this book was very strong. I agree that it, one of my complaints with the book, though, one of the things that I thought was a little weird, a little odd, there are a number of caption boxes that feel very classic in that they are describing like what, what's yeah. happening in the room. It's like yeah. Spawn, uh, you know, Spawn realizes that this is a trap, but he's too angry to care. And I'm like, I don't know that, I don't yeah. know that I needed these. Uh, and they agreed, show up agreed. kind of often. Yeah. That it, it, I, I did not like those in particular. I wasn't the biggest fan of that either. Especially yeah. there were ones that like, were even like more sort of that weren't even just his headspace, but were literally described like, and Spawn lunges forward to, like, go... Like, there were ones that were just <laughs> legit descriptions of, of the, yeah. like, physicality, which I really don't ever feel like I need. Mm-hmm. But they weren't, like, for the most part... There were a couple pages, maybe, where they were They weren't, for the most part, like, plopped on the page in such yeah. heavy number that I was like, this is making the page oh, take so sure. much longer yeah. to read or is slowing it down a ton. But I, I agree with you. But the other ones I didn't love was... I didn't love the news broadcasts. I yeah. didn't think they added a ton. Um, I got the idea. I think it was an interesting idea. I don't mm-hmm. know if it was super necessary, especially because they come back like two or three times. And I yeah. was like, uh, I don't know if, if that was super necessary. And I don't opinion. know that they were expanding my knowledge of the situation enough to justify their presence. Like, yeah. if I were to choose between a page with three news broadcasters and, like, a kind of irrelevant text next to them, or a page where Spawn is, like, punching someone in the heart. Yeah. i yeah. I choose the punching in the heart. You know? So it, th- it, not, to, not to get too, like, meta or removed here... I don't know if this is the case when Sean Lewis is writing a book compared to when Tom McFarlane is writing a book. I have heard Tom McFarlane mention in interviews doing stuff like pages like that when artists tell them that they are, like, behind or they need, like, a couple mm. pages. Because Todd McFarlane, from my understanding, does not write an entire script at once. He will, like, write a few pages and send that to the artist while he's then working on the next few pages. So sometimes the... I don't know if that's the case with Sean Lewis. So this is pure, you know, just yeah. throwing that out there because I've, I've heard Todd McFarlane speak to his process involving, like, ah, they need a break, so maybe there'll be a page that's just talking heads because they spent all this time drawing this super intricate spawn right. thing on the on the previous page. So that is just a possibility that I'm throwing out. I still don't love those pages, but... Think no, I mean, I, that being I, the I, case, I whether or not it was an actual timing thing, that does kind of contextualize it within, like, spawn language. Like, oh, this yeah. is something that happens in spawn books. There are these kind of, oh, yeah. you know, 
I think it happened way pages. more in the beginning spot. Like the very beginning of Spawn, mm-hmm. I, 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 I think one of the common criticisms is there's pages that are essentially just like a novel with like one picture of Spawn on them. It's like ah, here's Spawn, and then here's this novel of text. Um, but you know, so at least it, the book made it out on time. Yeah, yeah, you know. But there, there's, there's definitely, I think, again, limited experience, but some experience. Yeah, I think yeah. that there's, there's, you know, an existence of this type of storytelling within mm-hmm. Spawn's universe. That being said, I, I feel very confident giving just a broad and all-encompassing statement of I did not have a single problem with the art in this book. I, it's it's like, I, I, I joke about it all the time and I talk about it all the time. I don't know if there's a man in comics with a better eye for talent than Todd McFarlane. Like, he finds the best artists working and he gives them the work that they want to do and the stuff that they're excited about and, pay, and all that so they you get their best work. You get the best work of the best artists in Spawn books. And I think that's why Spawn has been able to exist for as long as it has and sell as well as it has. It's just like, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're opening up a Spawn comic, you're getting some of the best artwork in the comics. And that's, you know what? That's a good, that's a nice thing. That's a good reputation to have. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I specifically like so much about it is that, uh, obviously Spawn born in the nineties and all that good stuff has a lot of those like big action vibes but I feel like the art has adapted so, so well over time where it is artists that I love to see doing this work. Uh, and it never feels like uh, it's stuck in the past or anything. Like the art feels modern while also having all of that insane energy that the nineties are known for. Uh, so I think that it's just super, super successful in that. Yeah. Fully agree. I think that the designs are pretty much the ones that have carried over the best, you know, yeah. uh, of 90s characters. And and I think a lot of that's a testament to Todd McFarlane. Like, you hear, you know, like, there's a lot of names thrown out, you know, of, of the people. It's like, ah, everybody's em- emulating Jack Kirby. Everybody's emulating Mike Mignola. Like, the, Todd McFarlane's another one of those ones where it's like, ah, people are told just to draw like Todd McFarlane in certain circumstances. Because I think he is the one from the 90s style that people were most like... No, maybe maybe this is what we do, you know, yeah. because I think that he has a lot of the dynana- dyna- dynamicism, dynamicism. Uh, dynamicism of the 90s without the, not without the exaggerated, his proportions are ridiculously exaggerated, as are most of the Spawn characters' proportions, but, like, in a different way, you mm-hmm. know, like, it's 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 more, I think, two characters instead of, like, up big and wide, like, you have people who are lanky, if they're supposed to be lanky, and the villains might be these huge, wide monster brutes, and then, mm-hmm. you know, or other characters will be, like, V-shit, whatever. So, like, yeah. exaggerated proportions, but in a different way. But I, I right. agree with you, I think it's adapted very well to this era, yeah. specifically King Spawn. Yeah. Um, but that being said, I, I I think I've said my piece, more or less. Is there anything else you want piece. to add with our, no, our, our I, praise I, uh, for the king? So I, I, I'll, I'll throw out, you know, just a little bit more praise for Javier Fernandez's artwork, yes. you know, if, if we haven't done it enough. We talked about the and we talked about kind of issue of these big spreads. The action is so ridiculously mm-hmm. good, um, which I know is, is kind of throughout the dynamicism, but I never felt like in these big bombastic pages or two-page spreads that I couldn't follow the action. Agreed. So it was easy to follow, and I knew exactly what the momentum and the ter- types mm-hmm. of the fight were. So, yes. huge shout out to Javier Fernandez for his incredible layouts. Absolutely. But other than that, I am ready to go into All into right. ratings. Let's do it. Yeah. You want to start us off or should I? Um, why don't you? I'm just debating where I want to put this. <laughs> I can see you live editing the document. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's moving between spaces. Uh, well, I, I like this book a lot. Uh, as someone who doesn't have a ton of experience for Spawn, uh, this was a, like you said, plot-wise accessible, but I think character-wise a little bit a little bit rough. Um, and I don't know that Spawn is like the type of comic that I, I myself am like the, the, the specific audience for. That being said, it was still incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, I am going to rock this in. Uh, at a 7 out of 10. I I think it was better than a good book, uh, but just not, you know, my type of book. That, that's fair. Do, do you want yeah. me to get my rating first, or do you want to do, and then we both uh, do top 10? Go ahead and do your rating, then we'll do okay. our top 10. I'm going to fully agree with you. I give this a 7 out of 10. It's, it's 
I, I, I've been giving a lot of books to this because it is that point for me where I'm like, it's just really like seven out of 10 is just really good. Like there's yeah. no, like, like it's really well made. It's really well done. Like that's, that's where I end up landing with a lot mm-hmm. of those books to have the room for the books that are like, ah, even better and even better and even better, especially <laughs> as we start to form these top 10 lists. Right. So this is going to be another one that lands at a seven out of 10. The artwork is phenomenal. The mm-hmm. story is really solid and really strong. Um, and there's a lot of great dialogue writing. There's a few things that I have hangups about, like those pages of the news broadcast and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's that's where I'm rocking it. I really like it. It's a good book. But do All you right. want to do top 10 list now? I will happily do top 10 list now. So okay. at the top of my list, as always and forever, Noctera Full Throttle Dark. Uh, then <laughs> New Teen Titans Volume 1. Then Above Snakes, another Sean Lewis book. Uh, the yeah. Batman and Robin at number four. Chicken Devil Under Pressure at number five. World's Finest Batman and Superman, The Devil Neza at number six. Tied at number seven still. Radiant Black, Not So Secret Origin. And Paper Girls Volume 1. So rocking in at uh, number nine here is going to be King Spawn Volume 1, which puts Rain at number 10 and is kicking Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths off of my list. How about you? Yeah, um, I had to remember what I'm knocking off the list because I deleted it, and I was like, "God, that was your twofer." Stupid. Yeah, yeah, no, don't worry, I, I, I've remembered now. Um, anyway, so at the top of my list is also Noctera Volume One, followed by Batman and Robin Volume One, followed by New Teen Titans Volume One, followed by the other Sean Lewis book, Above Snakes, at number four. At number five, we have Dark Crisis on Infinite Earths. At number six, we have Radiant Black Volume 1. At number seven, Ultimate Spider-Man Volume 1. Number eight is where I'm going to slot in King Spawn Volume 1. At number nine is Savage Dragon Baptism of Fire. And at number 10 is Fantastic Four by Wade and Ringo. And that's going to knock Chicken Devil and the recently joining joining it World's Finest uh, Batman Superman off the list. So, I will no never not be delighted by the fact that our top four are the same four books, but then our bottom six, I think, are except for King Spawn. Yeah, King Spawn has changed it. Different. It was completely different. <laughs> King Spawn has, has now changed that. Um, yeah. Which oh no, no, sorry. Just... Radiant Black was 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 the oh, number right. now. Radiant Black. Is, so it, so it was also. just Radiant Black. Now it's Radiant Black and King Spawn. And, uh, it's uh, just so funny to me <laughs> how. Similar our tastes are in some ways, but how different in others. I, I I think that the way that it goes, and maybe I'm, I'm I'm speaking out my ass here, but at least from talking to the comic book, I feel like stuff you like, stuff you think is good, tends to differ amongst people. But the things that people think are like the greatest, like elite <laughs> tier of comics, tend to be fairly like you don't come across many people who are like, man, Watchmen's ass, dude. Like why <laughs> I don't get why people are rating Watchmen hot, like. It's just not something that usually yeah. happens. So I think that there's like certain books that's just like, it doesn't matter your taste, oh, yeah. it's just so good, you know? That That is probably, probably correct. Uh, but speaking of Sean Lewis, as we did maybe two minutes ago now, uh, yeah. <laughs> we have an interview <laughs> with him and that also with Jonathan Marks Barvecchia of Bear yes. Pirate Viking Queen, uh, a new book coming out from Image. So I think we should go talk to them. Let's do it! Hello, everybody. We are joined by Sean Lewis and Jonathan Marks Baravecchia of Bear Pirate Viking Queen. Sean Lewis has worked on King Spawn, The Scorched, Above Snakes, and an Action Comics backup story. Jonathan has worked on The Dark Tower, Dark Tower Wolverines, Man Thing, and Doctor Strange. Thank you two so much for joining us. Of Thank course. It's our Have pleasure, it. yeah. Absolutely. So we typically start with the same question. We're going to throw it to both of you. You can take it in, in whatever order you guys want. How did each of you get started making comics? Uh, how did I, I? Sort of by accident or for fun. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I did it for fun. Um, I was in theater. I was running theater companies um, in the Midwest that were like, we were doing productions and we would tour them around the country and overseas and I had a guy do live animations for me for one of the plays. This was about seven years ago, I guess maybe eight. Um, and we took like an old school overhead projector and he would draw pictures on it while we cranked it. And it would kind of make a, a cartoon on the back wall in, in real time. It was really awesome. And 
his art looked like these like silver age superhero comics. And I was just like, do you read comics? And he was like, I do. And I was like, holy shit, like we should make a comic. And we were in the middle of nowhere in Iowa and we would get together at coffee shops and make a comic. And so we did, we made the comic and um, I didn't know what you did with a comic. So I very naively sent it to Eric Stevenson, who is the publisher at Image Comics. His, his email was on the site. It no longer is. I think I was <laughs> um, But his email was on the website. And I, I just was like, hey, we made a comic. I think you put out comics. <laughs> And um, I didn't hear anything for a long time. And then, like, literally, we were on tour with a show. I was about to go on stage, I remember, in uh, in New Hampshire at a, at a performing arts center. And my phone rang, like, 10 minutes before. And I picked it up. And it was like, hey, this is Eric Stevenson. Did you do Saints? I'm like, yeah. Wait, what? And he was like, we want to do it. And I was just like, all right, I have to go on stage, but I'll call you back. Um, and that was kind of, that was honestly the start. I grew up, I mean, I grew up loving comic books, but I never really knew how you got to make them uh, until I met Benjamin Mackey, who was the artist on, on that book. And then, yeah. And then it just kind of kept spinning. Then I was like a, a badger. <laughs> like, the minute that one got made, I was like, all right, I'm holding on to this as desperately as I, I can. So good job. And I mean, obviously it worked out. <laughs> It has. It's been a surprise, I think, for all of us. <laughs> okay. uh, how about you, Jonathan? How uh, did my you get my your start, start was was much less um, successful, I think, than Sean. I uh, so like pretty long story short. Grew up reading comics, loving comics, wanted to draw comics, wanted to be an artist. All these things are great. Uh, in high school, I was in my senior year of high school. I had the opportunity to make a comic book. My school did a, we called it a senior project, you know, where you could, most kids would do like an internship or, or you know, go work in whatever field they wanted. So I'm like, I want to make a comic book. I, I teamed up with a writer. And it was hard. It was, can I swear? Yeah, yeah I don't have to swear. To. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so no, so it good. was hard. <laughs> yeah, I caught myself. Uh, but it was fucking, it was really, really hard. It was hard, hard work. And I got like, I think we did finish the book. It was maybe 10 pages. But afterwards, you know, I was 17 or 18. I was like, absolutely not. Like, this is a thing that I cannot do. I don't want to do it. I thought it would be easy because I'm so good at art and I love comics so much and it's so hard. So I did that. It's terrible. My mom still has like 20 copies and it's just full on like Joe Mad, uh, Andy Kubert. Uh, who else did I rip off? Like Humberto <laughs> Ramos, like just swipes for everything. And it's like a, a retelling of a Greek myth. Anyway, uh, so so I'm like, I I don't, I can't do this. I don't want to do this. So I went, I, I sort of left it aside for, for a little while. And then as I got older and I, I went to college, I studied literature, which is something else I enjoyed, but I was like, I kind of missed art and I got back into comics. And I want to draw again and sort of found my way back and, and eventually came to the realization that I can't not have a career, have a creative career. Like I, I need to do something with art. And I, you know, as a tattoo apprentice and I was working with like some, some shoe designers and trying to get in galleries and all this stuff dabble 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 and I was like no at a certain point like I have to you have to focus and do the for me at least like focus on the one thing mm -hmm. to do well enough that then you can eventually branch out if that's what you want so like same same as when I was in high school I was like buckled down I was like right I'm back in comics I'm 100% in comics I'm gonna do my samples like I think I've told this to Sean before but I'm like who do I send them to like I don't really want to send them to Dark Horse first because like obviously whoever I send them to is going to give me work and I probably want to work for Marvel first. And so like, obviously I sent them to everybody. Nobody got back to me. So there was like years and years of that. Uh, and then eventually, you know, going to conventions uh, and meeting the same people, the same editors enough times that they see you improve enough mm -hmm. that, that eventually someone uh, takes, basically takes a risk on you. And it's like, well, okay, well let's go for it. So I, I started doing uh, my first professional work was with Aspen Comics mm -hmm. uh, when I was yeah. I was living out there, too. And so I, I kind of gotten to know those guys. And I think we this was maybe at San Diego or probably not pre pre what San Diego is now. But it was always a big show. I can't remember if it was there or not, but it doesn't matter. The uh, some some convention. So so that was it. Yeah. And then and then much like Sean, though, once you're in like everyone talks about. Like, how do you break in? And everyone's got a different story on how to break in. But, man, like, the breaking in is the easy thing. Like, staying there is 
the hard thing. Like, and, and for, for me, I mean, like you said, I have done work with Marvel and I've done covers for a bunch of great companies and worked with great people. But like, I don't think that many people know who I am because like comics is just funny like that. You know, a book like Bear Pirate with a writer like Sean that's consistently in shops that looks different, that all this stuff may turn some heads. And then it's like, cool, like we hang on to that because then people are hopefully excited about the next thing. Yeah. It's all about that, like fucking just hanging on. So. Well, I'm, but I do I'm, love comics. We're both very <laughs> glad that you've been hanging on because we specifically uh, were just blown away by the art on Bear Thank Pirate. You. Gorgeous. Uh, but the book is a very out there concept. Like you said, it, it's going to turn heads. Uh, how did you two connect? Where did this idea come from? Well, John's probably tired of me repeating this, but like... <laughs> no, I, I love this story. <laughs> it's funny. Like, we met by accident. So like... Without knowing it, we live in the same town. Um, like we both, we both moved mm-hmm. to the same town like a little under two years ago. Within, and, and I think within a, like a month of each other. Within like yeah. a month. So like I was doing above snakes with Hayden Sherman at Image, and um, I was scrolling through Instagram, and there was this amazing like you know cover that John had done. We'd never met. And just showed up, you know. I was I was doing the narcissistic thing where I was like hashtag above snakes. <laughs> yeah. I'm like seeing everything that popped up, and then this cover popped up at me, and I was like, holy shit, this is amazing. And so, you know, part of the grabbing on is I'm like, I should know who this artist is. So I I wrote John. I was just like, this cover is amazing. Like, do you do interior work? Like, what's your story? And then John was like, well, we should meet up. Are you on the East Coast? And I was like, yeah, I live in New York. And he was like, me too. And I was like, well, I live in upstate New York. He's like, me too. And I was like. <laughs> I live in the Hudson Valley. He was like, I do as well. And, I was like, I live in... and the nearest town to us that anyone knows is Beacon. And I was like, I live in Beacon. He was like, me too. And I was like, I actually am lying. I live the next town over. And he's like, I live in that town. So it turns out that John and I, John and I live literally a mile, one mile away from one. Yeah. Wow. Um, so once we connected on the fact that we live in the same place, we were like, let's get to yeah let's get together and hang out and we immediately were just like we should make a book like why talk about just talk about books let's make one and the hardest thing a lot of times is always i think for some people is just like well we got to make the perfect book or what's the book we make or what do we do i don't worry about that as much as maybe i should i'm really i mean i love i love collaborating so like i think it just started from i started asking john what are some things that john wanted to draw and then what were things we thought were cool in other books or what were books we loved growing up and we were at, we were at like a brewery, and I I feel like that's when like it was like bears are cool, and Vikings are cool. You know what's cool too is pirates, and it was like well maybe we could do a pirate book, and then we'll do a Viking book, and then we'll do a bear. I don't know what a bear book would be, but maybe we'll do a bear book. And I just was like fuck that. I'm like look, give me a week, and maybe I can figure out a way that they all are in the same world. <laughs> and that was kind of the start. I just kind of went off, and then sent John a weird epic poem and was like, I think this might be the start of, <laughs> of this. <laughs> like, tell me if you think I'm insane. It, it really, it started just with that kind of conversation of like listing things that were interesting to, to us. And I think that I had a sketchbook. So Sean's yeah, flipping through yes, yes. and he's like, this very sketchbook here, I think not, not great for an audio podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so, you know, flipping through that, the, okay, yeah, great. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, like flipping through that and then just listing, listing just nonsense shit. Like, you know, Bear Pirate, Viking Queen are the, the four obviously that we went with, but you know, what's fun? Yeah. Bears, Vikings are fun. Like, I think I was reading, I think I had just gotten back. I had been like up in, in Montreal and they had great, you know, French bookstores and like French comics and BD and, and stuff. Uh, and so I was like, I was, I'd been looking through a bunch of like nautical comics or something. I was like, oh, that's cool. And just listing like stuff that would be fun. And then, yeah, I'm like, all right, cool. So that's like a bunch of random stuff. And Sean, <laughs> Sean went back and figured out some, some sort of like outline. And then I will say like, we've talked about this before, like the, the collaborative aspect of this has been, has been amazing because it really was partly by virtue of the fact that we do live walking distance to each other uh you know would sean would send me a poem like how does this work oh this is awesome like 
I broke down this this poem that you sent me for like the first page. I think that's a 300 page comic. Like let's let's meet up and then let's break it down. Let's figure this out. And like, what if this happened or this happened? Or like, you know, you spent all this time showing talking about how like the boat does this thing, but I don't want to do that. Let's do this thing instead. And like, and, and to his credit, he's like, yeah, cool. You got to draw it. So <laughs> let's, let's like, if it, it, you know, it's not, it's not nonsense. Like if we, if we explore a different direction, yeah. so very mm-hmm. collaborative and, and, and rewarding uh, artistically at least. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Can you talk a little bit about finding kind of the home with image? How did you approach them about, uh, you know, kind of doing this book through them? I think this is my seventh book at image. Maybe, I mean, if I count the spawn stuff, it might be, it might be more. I mean, they're the first publisher I worked with. They were the publisher I did my first like five books with. Um, and Eric, Eric Stevenson's always been really, really supportive, like was supportive of saints. And then I did a book with Hayden Sherman called the few Mm -hmm. that Eric, is very public about like loving, like when it came out, I remember it, that came out in like 2017. And I remember Eric, Eric did like a massive interview. It was really kind of like, it was kind of one of those moments where I was like, Oh shit, maybe, maybe I do have a bit of a career or something in this. Cause he like came out in like a thing where they were talking about all, it was an image anniversary year. And mm-hmm. they were like, what's your favorite book that's coming out? And he was like, the few is like the best book we're putting out this year. And I was, and I didn't know he was going to say that. And I just remember reading the review and being like, Oh, or not the interview. And I was like, Holy shit my few like, <laughs> right. so i mean i i have a really good relationship with eric so the moment which is also i mean is a good way to like get people like john on because i'm like at the very least i know i can have it i can get eric to read it mm-hmm. um and yeah it was pretty quick i mean again we yeah. didn't even know we lived near each other uh, like 18 months ago um and the book's coming out in like two months so like we didn't even start it i think until like September of last year or after that? I'm not, I don't even I don't, know. I don't know. I mean, it's about a year. Yeah. About a year. Yeah. yeah. But we got the, I think Eric was on board by like this time last year, but like mm-hmm. February, yeah. February, February. So it was all pretty, pretty quick to get to the point where we knew it was going to have a publisher. That's yeah. So we we yeah. sent uh, the, the pitch pack, I think was like five or six pages. Actually, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's the final. You guys have seen the, the book. The the yeah. opening sequence was the the, the right. pitch. Well, uh, and yeah, I think I think uh, Sean reached out to Eric, and we had we heard back. Yeah, very and quickly, I, which was and I think great for, for people who are aspiring. Like I, what I will say is like when when I didn't know Image and I went with my with Saints, we did a whole first issue, which people mm-hmm. thought was insane because yeah. like like fully colored, fully lettered. We just did the whole book. Partially out of naivete, we didn't know, we, and we were making it for ourselves at the time, but it made a massive difference because when, when we sent it, it wasn't like, ah, we've, I've never made a comic professionally before. I'd done a lot of professional writing like in theater, and I'd done some stuff for This American Life, so I knew it was going to get read. Um, but I do think having the full book, Eric was able to look at it and just be like, oh, all right, I understand what you're doing, and clearly you can make a book. Mm-hmm. Um, so I say that a lot of times, like I think having a fully formed thing for aspiring writers and artists, and it doesn't have to be a mm-hmm. full book, but having like having a four page comic that really kicks ass or an eight page comic is like people need to see it and that you know how to mm-hmm. like do it. Um, well, and I'll, I'll add to that, too, like as to, and to aspiring makers or to any makers, like take the guesswork out of whoever you're pitching it to. Like, yeah. you know. For for us specifically, Sean has a relationship with Image and with Eric specifically, but I don't. And and there's always a risk involved in a new creator, new creative team. Like, take take as much risk out as you can and provide like the strongest thing. Whether you're a writer, an artist, a, a team, like this is exactly what I want to make. In fact, I've made it. This is the thing I want to produce. And and it, it, it lives or it dies, but you know. Right. The guesswork is often what slows things down or or has you uh, go back, uh, move backwards almost or, or, or redo. No, for very sure. Well yeah. said. Absolutely. And this this book is very much a best foot forward in so many ways. Uh, there are so many pages of just 
incredibly unique layouts. Uh, one spread has like 36 panels across two pages. It's insane. <laughs> uh, one of my favorites is uh, the sequence of where they're heading into a storm and it starts with this very starkly white framed oh, image yeah. of the ship going in and then there are just two gorgeous pages of swirling blacks. It's so cool. I uh, Thank you. The incredible watercolor you've done for this book and really unique lettering as well. Can you tell us a bit about your process putting that on the page? Yeah. the So I love, it, it's all, it's ink, oil, watercolor, gouache, all traditional work though, which is how mm -hmm. I do everything. The lettering I did uh, is digitally done, except for the sound effects, which are on the boards. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I love you know, for a book like this, it fits the book, but the, the looseness and the freedom that you can have with watercolor, mm -hmm. I like to embrace. And in a narrative medium like comic books, it's not always to the illustrator's benefit. You know, my job is to tell the story. And if the art is ambiguous, that doesn't tell a particularly good story often. Um, but but I like to sort of embrace that and, and mix that looseness with the hard. I mean, like I, like the artist I mentioned earlier with my high school comic book, I grew up on pretty traditional Western comic book artists, mm -hmm. all of whom I still love, um, but who are, if you look at my work, may not be as readily apparent, but are definitely there in my DNA. You know, big spot blacks and hard lines and, and, and sort of still comic book anatomy most of the time you know, exaggerated anatomy is really what I mean, um, is still there, but like at the same time, embracing the looseness and sort of the emotional aspects of, of watercolor and of ink in a way that I think most Western comics don't. I, uh, I, one of my biggest influences just artistically is, is a painter, comic book artist, illustrator, painter, uh, teacher, uh, named George Pratt, who, has done a few comics is amazing, amazing uh, artist in general. But uh, I was listening to an interview with him once and he was talking about the emotional honesty of a line of the line. And, and I took that to mean, you know, when I was first getting started and again, coming from like tattooing apprenticeship and where everything is like tracing paper, build up the forms, find the right line and then pull that right line. I, I threw all that out the window and started to focus on the emotional quality of the lines I put down. So if you ever see, I think, I don't even know if Sean's seen much of my layouts, but it's very like gestural mm -hmm. the panels here. The figure is a, is a circle here with, you know, two ball joints for the shoulders. And then that's it. And I do shoot a lot of photographic uh, photography uh, for reference. So I have, I have a base that I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. to build off of but then I don't build on the page I just use I usually use nibs or brushes and I pull the line and whether or not it's an accurate line it's an honest line and building from that and then moving into the watercolor I I'm able to like uh sort of embrace the spontaneity of the of the medium and the emotional honesty of the medium but also I think hopefully uh like maintain the the narrative integrity of like we're, we're we are telling a story. This is not me right. just yeah. jerking off. Like this is for a specific, <laughs> um, uh, uh, like the, the, uh, a specific end result. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's all very like oh, whatever <clears throat> blah, 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 artsy artsy. But no, it's you so know, cool. That, that's that's very yeah. much like in the back of my head. And at the same time too, like it's comic books. It's a it's a comic book about a bear viking pirate queen like it's silly <laughs> nonsense but also it's like in my head it's like very like this is how i think about art in general uh, and then the lettering it was important for me to to do it too just as partly control freak and partly just like having one i think one voice uh or, or two voices obviously but but one like visual voice um right. it, it helps the the book flow a little bit a little bit easier it doesn't distract not that there aren't great letterers out there in comics now, but of course. it was something that I wanted to do. I, uh, David Mazzucchelli famously would go into the Marvel bullpen when there was a bullpen when he was on Daredevil and review the pages before they went to print, review the letters, review the colors if he wasn't doing the colors. 
you know, because like, for better or for worse, it's his name that people are going to associate right. with it. And, yeah. and he wants to be the last, the last hand, the last fingerprint on the page was, was something that he was always, uh, it was always important to him. And I sort of always remember that. That's the same thing with me. Now it's, it's even easier because so much is online and it is digital. So, you know, Sean was, was down. I designed the fonts and, and mm -hmm. so each character has a different voice and, and, yeah. uh, you know, hopefully the whole page just comes together without pulling you out of it at all. Well, I it think you, you achieved does. a really good, you know, combination. The lettering fits really well in with your style, which is so unique. So I, I would say you nailed you. it on that. Hell yeah. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But, but I want to ask you guys, this is an oversized issue. This is, I think, 72 pages. It's real big. But you're keeping the cover price at $5 when so many books now that are going kind of bigger are going higher in price. So why did you decide to do that? And how did you manage to do that? How, I guess, we'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> How is you just kind of, when Image asks what the price is going to be for the book, you just say, like, that's this is what we'd like to charge. And then I guess you learn later, like, man, that was a good decision or that was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some of the model of it is when I when I did the few and when I did Thumbs, those are both oversized issues that we also kept at four ninety nine. Like, each issue of the few was, like, between 50 and 60 pages. Um and at the time, people were like, you were insane. And then I think like two or three years later, DC was putting out like 30 page books for $10. It was like, yeah. I don't know if we're that crazy. <laughs> um, like, so I don't know. I think it's a level of affordability. And I think, I don't know. I, For me, at least, I'll speak for myself. I believe in the book. The book is really, really different, really exciting. The art is unbelievable. And so I was just like, man, if we don't get a lot of people buying this book at $5, then I don't think we would get more selling it at eight. And I don't, you know, like you just start yeah. to go like, how much do you bet on the book? I think, I, and sometimes I get frustrated with modern comics because I think there's sometimes <laughs> a level of like, how do we get as much money from the reader? But I don't always know that the quality of the books are matching the price tag of the books personally. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's all practical, frankly. Like you know, we want the barrier of entry, or or, or I, my thinking, you know, to keep the barrier of entry as as low as possible. We all love comics. Comics are not so cheap anymore. You know, if you go to the shop every week or every month or whatever, and you're dropping thirty, fifty, seventy bucks, you know, are you really going to add another ten dollar book? Are you going to take a chance on a ten dollar book? Mm -hmm. eh, maybe, but. You know, for four ninety nine, can you afford not to buy it? I don't know. It's also a retailer thing. Like you have to respect what the retailers have to deal with and go hundred percent. Yeah. Suddenly saying to them, like, hey, this book is gonna be on your shelf for three months, which means like it's not like there's a year of building up audience for it, and then we're gonna have a ten dollar issue. But saying like, you know, we know you guys are hurting already, but you should spend ten dollars on this and buy at least fifty copies for your shop. Like the math of that is like huge ass yeah. mm -hmm. so that that's also part of it is i think like we have to think of both not only the reader but very much the retailer of like how does how do we help if we're going to do something a little bit different how do we help everyone as much as possible to to trust it you know now that's a a, a really good point with something different because for me looking at it I'm like oh man this this looks like a, a book that should be more expensive but seeing it as a you know someone is going to have to take a chance on something different. Mm -hmm. I definitely am seeing what you're coming from with that, with that perspective for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing people in like, in on some of the sites. I, I do get happy when I see people on the sites who are like, the art looks insane and it's 72 pages for four ninety nine. <laughs> I have to add this. And I'm like, yes, yeah, yes. You are the person that we were trying to get <laughs> yeah. in. I had someone reach out to me on, on Instagram asking if that was a misprint in the lunar uh, catalog. <laughs> Like, nah, man. Like that, yeah. That's, that's it all. Is that just is accurate. an insane yeah. good deal. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, we 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 like Sean said. Like, we believe in the book. We'll see if this comes back. If this is a success, uh, like as a business venture or not, we'll see. But, but just to get as many eyes on the book, uh, on a book that we're proud of, is important. If it's a success, though, what's great about it is it'll be copied, and I think that'll be better for everybody. 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that that's one thing I'm hoping for. Cause I know even for myself as a collector and reader, I'm like, I, I, it's tough. It's tough to keep yeah. adding books and, you know, you start looking at what your weekly, <laughs> your weekly like cut yeah. is like, shit. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You feel well. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's kind that of a final question readers, here, you know, read <laughs> <laughs> to get those readers to uh, to to bring everyone to Bear Pirate Viking Queen. If you had to just quickly explain the book, try to quickly sell it to someone, what's the the kind of short pitch that you would give? I mean, the shortest pitch would be it's the most beautiful book of the year. Like it's it's like stunning, <laughs> visually just a beyond stunning book and if you fucking like vikings and pirates and battles and blood and war um it's it's beautiful and has that <laughs> yes <laughs> yes i would say if yes if you like any of those nouns in the in our title pick up the book if you've been reading comics for a long time pick up the book because sean and i were going out of our way to make a book that would be exciting for longtime comic book readers that wouldn't be as predictable or as like, uh, like colored by fill in the color, whatever it's called, color by number. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. an ambitious. <laughs> so, it's an, sort of off there. I will say that like, it, it's an incredibly ambitious book. Yes. Um, you know, when we started talking, we were throwing out. You know, it was interesting because it was like dating because we were getting to know each other too. So it's a lot. Of, well, what books do you read? What books do you <clears> like? We both kept falling on like a lot of the same like like old school Vertigo books. And when we started working on this, I kept personally thinking, I don't even know if I ever expressed the job, but I kept thinking a lot about From Hell. Like I love that book and the size and the scope and it's historical and ahistorical at the same time. And so I was like, I want to make something that I can, that like, I don't know. It might be like my own aggro behaviors, but I'm like, I want something that will challenge from hell. <laughs> like, yeah. I want to make that. Um, and so that, that I think is like, it, it, it is a big, a big push for it. Like it's epic, you know, like yeah. I, I don't usually, I usually am much more humble about works, but I'm like, <laughs> this is like huge, man. It's, it's a pretty gorgeous and different undertaking. Absolutely agree. Uh, but I think yeah. that's going to bring us to a wrap on our interview today. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if Thanks there's anything you want to plug, if you have the final order cut off for Bear Pirate Viking Queen. Yeah, I was just going to say, please do yeah. the, the like Sean said, like shops, it makes the shop's lives easier, makes our lives easier. Ordering and buying comics is more confusing than it should be, but <laughs> final order cut off April 8th. So do tell your shops uh, before then, definitely add it to your pool box. Yeah, yes. and also if you want cheaper books at bigger size, your pre-order is massive. Mm -hmm. Because it tells the retailer you like it, it tell and it, it tells the publisher they're not crazy. Because it's it's also a big thing to say to a publisher like we want to do seventy two pages in full color and we want to charge five dollars. Yeah, for it, no. you know, the publisher themselves are going like, oh shit. Um, you know, the image has been insanely supportive and I think like they've even pushed it where they're like, we think you'll get a lot of people if we do it at this rate. Yeah. But I also think it's a bigger thing of like, you get, you, you can demand, mm -hmm. the, the industry is a little bit, um, shaky, mm -hmm. but I think that's an amazing time for both the retailers. It's scary for the retailers, but I think amazing for them. And it's incredible for the readers because you actually have so much more influence than you realize right now because mm -hmm. no one knows what to do. None of the publishers know what to do to be successful. So literally your purchasing, your pre-order starts to tell them this is what works. Absolutely. 100%. So we'll have links to both of your uh, social media links and everything in the description. People want to follow you to Bear Pirate Viking Queen as well. So if you want any of that info, look down below. But I think that's going to bring us to the end of the interview. Thank you both so much again. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. What an awesome interview with Sean Lewis and Jonathan Marks Barvecchia. Bear Pirate Viking Queen looks so red. Can't wait to pick it up. Yep, and remember to pre-order that, add it to your pull list. You still got a couple weeks before it comes out, and pre-orders are super important for indie books like Bear Pirate Viking Queen if you want to see it continue. 
That's right, uh, but it has not been all sunshine and rainbows in the indie community lately, unfortunately. Uh, this coming Saturday, we have a bonus bonus episode. Uh, it's a pretty different one for our podcast. If you want to hear more from us, uh, please take the time to watch our deep dive into Scout Comics and the recent allegations that have been brought to light against them. Uh, we worked incredibly hard on it, conducted a number of interviews. It's really worth the watch, especially if, you're, if you've considered pitching to them or care about the indie comic scene. Absolutely. So stay tuned for that on Saturday. But uh, as usual, we will have our full length episode coming next Wednesday. That's right. Uh, with a number of polls. Jay, what are we pulling? So we have five polls next week. No number ones, unlike this week. Um, but we have the one hand number two, Our Bones Dust number four, Petrol Head number five, Sinister Sons number two, and the end of the first Transformers arc with Transformers number six. The end of Daniel Warren Johnson's art. It's a tragedy, yes. truly. Truly disappointing. Uh, but we have another great writer artist in our back issue review coming next week. We are going to be reading. Uh, drum roll, please, I suppose. <laughs> nice job. I'm sure that's going to sound great. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Lemire's. Uh, his book, Maze Book, it's an indie book that came out through Dark Horse a few years ago. Uh, I was picking it up as it was coming out, but remember very little about it. So I'm excited to reread and discuss. Should be fun. It should. But be. that's all we've got for you guys this week. Check out that Scout video on Saturday. Yes. But if not, as usual, we will see you next week, Comic Geeks. And uh, Batman First Night New Rome. I'm gonna speak Spanish. I'm gonna start over. Okay. Because I'm not comfort. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis. It is siete, but I, I unnecessary. <laughs>